Setting Up the Sun on the Shores of Los Angeles, California, Best Coast is a band that was conceived in early 2009 with mastermind singer-songwriter Bethany Cosentino and master of all instruments, Bob Bruno. Today we are going to go over the origins of this group that loves California so much and how recording simple dream pop melodies in their bedroom came to be and how they would come to record at the famous Capitol Records studios in Los Angeles. Eventually would go on tour with huge bands like Green Day, Go Go's, Pixies, this little indie band would top the charts through the upcoming years. So sit back with your cat, smoke some weed while we head to the beach. This is Best Coast, a history. Bethany Sharia Cosentino was born on November 3rd of 1986 in Glendale, California. She grew up in a little suburb near the top of Glendale called La Crescenta. Her parents were both from Omaha, Nebraska and they moved to Los Angeles for their careers. Her dad wanted to pursue his music career and her mom was a fashion designer and also acted in commercials. Beth grew up as an only child and she always wanted to be the center of attention. She started singing since the age of four to Disney soundtracks like The Little Mermaid. Beth Cosentino when I'm four years old. Could be part of that world. She also wanted to follow in her mom's footsteps and become an actress. She asked her mom if she could star in commercials just like her, and her mom said yes. Even though Beth's TV commercial career would be short, it was nevertheless entertaining. She did only star in a handful of them at her young age, with one of them being for a toy store in the Midwest, but the most popular bit she did was for Little Caesar's Pizza. It was a Congo line which starred a poodle walking dog, and supposedly this commercial was aired on the Super Bowl. Beth's final commercial that she did was for Pepsi. She stated that she had a fever the whole entire night and had to stay up until 2 in the morning and after that commercial she decided she didn't want to do commercials anymore. She was a kid and she wanted to enjoy her youth. It was too much work. And a lot of people mistake her for being a child star actress growing up, but she only starred in a couple commercials. So with the end of her child stardom, she turned to the music side of things, like her father. Her dad was a drummer, and he was a touring drummer at that, playing with bands like Bad Finger and a Monkees tribute band called The Missing Lynx. And through the years, her dad would jump from cover band to cover band. Beth would slowly start to take piano lessons, opera lessons, singing lessons, and would slowly start to perform in school talent shows and plays in musical theater. And supposedly, not sure if this is true or not, she sang the national anthem when she was six to eight years old at Dodger Stadium. Couldn't find any videos on this, I'm not sure if it's true, saw it in an interview, but who knows. It wasn't until she was about 13 years old until she received her first guitar from her dad. One of her favorite bands at the time was a band called Hanson. As she got older, she really got into pop punk bands like Blink-182. First songs she learned how to play on guitar were from the Blink-182 album, Dude Ranch. But it wasn't until she got into Operation Ivy that she finally started to get serious about the guitar and take lessons. She also played softball throughout her youth growing up, but eventually would stop to focus more on music. And when she was in seventh grade, her and her best friend Jessica, who is still her best friend to this day, would go to this record store called Tempo Records, which unfortunately closed down in recent years. There used to be this quote unquote hot, punk guy that worked there who had dyed black hair and he would always recommend punk music to the customers and she stated that she owes her punk love to him. The town she grew up in was a very suburban town where everyone acted the same, so she wanted to stand out and be different, and punk led her into this. She also started dating a lot of skater guys, and they also showed her new music. 
All she knew before was mainstream music, and finding these new bands was like a Candyland board game to her, jumping from band to band to band to band. During her time in middle school, her dad would take her and Jessica to their first concert. The concert was at the Hollywood Palladium, and the bands that were playing were 311 and Jimmy's Chicken Shack. She also stated this was the first time she quote unquote kind of got high. Everyone was smoking weed at the show, and her dad was a big stoner and recognized the smell. And right after the show was over, he was trying to get the girls out of there ASAP. Bethany was introduced to marijuana at a young age. When she was about eight years old, she found her dad's weed stash. And being a curious eight-year-old, she asked him what was this, and he said that it was incense, and his Native American friend gave it to him. But Bethany soon would find out what marijuana actually was, and she said at the young age, she hated that her dad used to do it all the time. She didn't start smoking weed until her late teen years, and she would do it every once in a while by herself, but once she hit her 20s, she dove right into the pot addiction and started smoking all the time. Growing up, Beth also had to go to church. Her parents were both Christians, but Beth would make the most of it by joining her Christian church rock band. They would cover pop punk songs, but instead of having the hardcore lyrics, they would change the lyrics into singing about Jesus and God. Around this time, Beth would also start writing some of her first songs. When she was 13, she wrote her first song about her boyfriend that broke up with her. When Beth turned 15 years old, her parents went through a divorce, which was very confusing and hard on her as an only child. Her parents never really got along the best and she stated she saw a lot of weird things growing up. She was really confused on how love was supposed to be shown, and Beth would slowly start to develop very bad anxiety and depression. She would sleep in all day and was very moody and never wanted to leave her room. This type of behavior describes a lot of high schoolers. She was diagnosed with bipolar 2 and ADHD, and she started taking medication for her mental illness. It soon stopped because she started to gain weight. During her freshman year of high school, she was very much into the surf and skater culture. She wore a lot of Roxy and had a bad haircut with bangs. But through the rest of high school, she was more of a mall punk, and she bought a lot of punkorama compilations. Beth really started writing songs when she was about 15 years old. She was trying to do a singer-songwriter type of thing, and she uploaded her music to purevolume.com. Once MySpace was developed, she started uploading her music there. She uploaded music under the name Bethany Sharea. Sharea was her middle name, and she was named after the Amy Grant song, Sharea. You can still find find some of these songs on YouTube if you look up Bethany Sharea. They're not bad songs. They're very different from anything she's done as Best Coast though. Some of my favorite songs are Los Angeles, Underground, and books I've read. When Beth was 16 years old, she was invited to be a backup singer for Ellie Lawson who was playing on the Ellen DeGeneres show. She stated that her dad recorded drums on one of Ellie's latest records, and that's how she had the connections to get in and perform. At a young age, things slowly started to get big for her musically. Soon, Beth got bored of high school and decided to drop out, but she still went ahead and got her GED later on. And around this time, she was playing shows as a singer-songwriter. Say I love you, Bethany. After one of her shows at the Hotel Cafe, an agent from Atlantic Records approached Beth, and she stated that Beth needs a record deal ASAP, and her parents were ecstatic about the news. Beth turned them down. She was still a kid and wanted to enjoy her youth, and her parents were a little disappointed. She also stated that she was in fear of being turned into a pop princess if she took the record deal. But Beth always knew that she would pursue music one day, but just not yet. Even though she turned this deal down, she was still very much into music and would attend a lot of concerts and even sang at some karaoke clubs, like one called the Aquarium. 
waiter. Beth would also fall in love with the local DIY punk venue in Los Angeles called The Smell. The first time she ventured to The Smell, her mom was the one who took her, and right before she dropped Beth off, she didn't like the part of town it was in, and was scared Beth was going to get killed or kidnapped, so she turned the car around and forbade Beth from going to this venue. Beth, being the angsty teenager she always was, called up her friend to come and pick her up, and she snuck out of her house to go to The Smell. Like a lot of kids her age, she said The Smell changed her life for the good, and the first band that she saw play was The Locust. As Beth attended more concerts, at the smell, she became friends with the local bands down there, like Mika Miko, which included Jennifer and Jessica Clavin, who later formed Bleach. When Beth was 18 years old, she finally played in her first quote unquote real band called Wake Up San Francisco, which included some of the members and friends of Mika Mika. It was a disco punk band. The band was short-lived, but they did end up playing a couple shows. During this time, Beth started attending Pasadena Community College for writing and fashion design. She also was working numerous part-time jobs as a retail associate and a fast food worker. She stated that when she was younger, she was pretty bad at keeping a job, and sometimes she even had her mom call up her work before she went in and tell them that she's never coming back. In 2005, when Beth was 19 years old, she met Amanda Brown through an old boyfriend. Amanda acted like an older sister to Beth, and they would eventually start a drone experimental group called Pocahaunted. At this point, Beth stated that she was dying to be in any real band. She also said she wasn't passionate about the music Pocahaunted was creating, but it still was fun. And at this time, she would meet Bob Bruno at The Smell, and Bob would later be her partner in crime when she started up Best Coast. Bob was several years older than Beth, but they bonded over bands like The Beach Boys, which was super surprising to Beth, because Bob looked like the type to only listen to metal and heavy rock. Bob was born on May 10th of 1973, and surprisingly at the same hospital that Bethany was born at in Glendale. Bob started playing music when he was about 13 years old, he started playing drums. He grew up in the 80s where metal was very popular, and he said he couldn't match the drumming style. So he eventually switched to bass, and then he started learning guitar when he was 19 years old. He said he learned guitar as a joke at first, because all of his friends were shredding like Eddie Van Halen, Randy Rhodes, Slash, Dave Murray, and many, many more. And it took him a long time until he became really good at the guitar. Getting back to Pocahontas, Beth stated that Bob was really the invisible member he would help come up with songs and he produced some of their first records and they came out on cassettes through Amanda Brown's record label, Not Not Fun Records. And they recorded it on Bob's Tascam Mid Studio 688 8 track. Bob also used his 8 track to record records with Mika Miko as well. Bethany stated that it was really her and Bob who came up with all of the songs and did all of the work for the band, and Amanda didn't really help out too much. The most success Pocahontas received is when they opened for Sonic Youth in Berkeley in 2007. Beth was growing tired of the same routine every single day, and she had her eye on New York to further her college experience. She stated that she's been to New York a couple times, and she really liked the area and wanted to move there. So she set off to New York and attended Eugene Lang College, the New York School for Liberal Arts. Right before her departure, she went to go and get a tattoo of a California bear tatted on her arm to never feel homesick. She went to school for creative writing and was focusing on primarily nonfiction. And she was a big fan of Joan Didion. And Beth was also an intern for Fader and wrote some articles for them while she was in New York. Once the winter season hit and temperatures dropped below freezing, Beth was starting to miss the sunny state that she called home. She had to wake up every morning in Brooklyn, take the train to get to school in the snowfall. Beth started comforting herself by listening to the Beach Boys. And she started writing her college papers on the history of California. California and how much she loved and missed it. Her college professor even pulled her aside to ask her if she was okay and she seemed like she was really homesick. Beth said she tried to keep pushing through, but it eventually took a toll on her, and she decided to just drop out mid-semester. She called her mom to come pick her up. She packed up all of her things, and she was back in the 75 degree heat of California before she could blink. Bethany lived in New York for about nine months, 
Beth knew before she left New York that she wanted to try writing and recording music again, but she knew she couldn't do it alone, so she reached out to her old friend Bob and asked if he would be down to help her record music when she gets back in town. Bob was more than obliged to help, and once Beth got home, she immediately started writing songs and recording them on GarageBand. She would record the rough demo on GarageBand of her just playing guitar and singing, and then Bob would add drums, more guitar, and bass. Even though they lived five minutes away from each other, they both were very self-conscious about their writing. Beth thought Bob would hate everything she wrote, and Bob thought Beth would hate everything he wrote and they were nervous about playing the melodies in front of each other, and it was just easier to send it via email. They both ended up really loving it. She still had to pay the bills, so she got a job working at the retail store Lush, and she would also sell her vintage clothes on eBay. As she continued to write more and more songs, she needed a name for her project. She texted the name to Bob, How About Best Coast, and Bob thought it was amazing. She named it after the love for California she had, and how she thought the West Coast was the best coast. It's also a play on her initials, BC, Bethany Cosentino, Best Coast, but she didn't do that on purpose. And she also was really into the West Side rap scene, and a lot of rappers mentioned West Coast is the best coast. It was an homage to the West Coast rap scene. So Best Coast was officially born in March to April of 2009. Beth would sit on her floor writing for hours on end new songs every day. How the songwriting process first came along was she would write the chords and the melody of the song, and then lyrics would come last. And on gloomy days, she would write slower, sad songs, but on the sunny days, she would write upbeat and happy songs. But the songs were never officially done until Bob lays down his tracks. Surprisingly, Bob loved working on Best Coast material. He said he's never been able to work with poppier songs before, and a majority of her first songs would be revolving around boys. Even though Beth never states who that boy is, everyone assumed that she was talking about her also upcoming lo-fi surf punk artist boyfriend, Nathan Williams, aka Waves. I wanna see the waves, the waves, the waves. I wanna be a punk, I wanna sing the song. Beth and Nathan had known each other for a very long time. She actually met him right before his 19th birthday party. Beth was 17, and her friend named Hayden took her down to San Diego for a party, and she met Nathan down there, and they hit it off. It really started just as a summer fling. They would take the train up and down to see each other, and steal pills from Beth's mom's house, and listen to Wu-Tang Clan, watch Seinfeld, and they even attended the FYF festival as attendees and this was way before they created their bands, but they would eventually part ways. And the first time Beth broke up with Nathan was in Portland, and it was because he was drunk dancing on the table of a bar, and she said that he was acting like an idiot. But of course, their paths would come back to each other eventually, and for the next decade, they would be on-again, off-again boyfriend and girlfriend. But their very first date was at Mario's house, who was the owner of Art F.A.G. Records. Not gonna say it, not getting cancelled this day. <laughs> And Mario's label would release some of Best Coast's original songs. The first EP that Best Coast had done was called Where the Boys Are, and it was originally put out on cassette, but later reissued as a CD, was released through Blackest Rainbow Records. The album title could have been named after the 1960s movie Where the Boys Are, and in my opinion, this was the worst Best Coast EP that was ever released, and that is only due to the production quality of this. Ear piercing, and like not even a good ear piercing, just like it's like holy shit that hurts my ears. The only two notable ones that are worth listening to are Moody and Angsty. Some of the other songs on the EP like Boy, Gloomy, and Space Baby are so blown out. I'm not sure if they were trying to go for this type of sound, but fuck man. You definitely have to have a certain type of ear to listen to this EP. The next EP that they would release was called Sun Was High, and it was put out on Mario's label Art FAG Records. The sound was drastically better from their first release. It still had the blown out distortion and fuzziness in the amps, but it was way more comprehensible and enjoyable. It is a unique album cover, which is an overpass of a freeway in Los Angeles in the 1970s. The first song, Sun Was High and So Was I, was the first song 
Bethany wrote as Best Coast. It was a beautifully but simple song about going for a walk, watching the cars go by, the sun was so high and so was I, and the simple guitar riff is just beautiful. It's a very romantic song. The next song, So Gone, is about a guy coming into her life and going out of her life, and vice versa. She is saying that he is so gone and that she is so gone, and the ooze in the middle of the song really make it come together. Just like Sun Was So High, it was another slow but romantic song. And the last song on the 7 inch, That's The Way Boys Are, is a Leslie Gore cover. And Bethany has stated before that she wished she could sing like Leslie Gore. The song is about a minute and 20 seconds, and you might miss it if you don't listen. And I think this song is 10,000 times better than the Leslie Gore song. Obviously, this is way more blown out than the original done by Leslie Gore, and I would say this was the fastest song on the album. Their next release was another 7-inch. It was a split 7-inch with the band Jeans Wilder. It was the band's first attempt at a doo-wop song. It mimicked the song Sleepwalk by Santo and Johnny. And this song was again about another guy being in another town with another girl. A lonesome love song that had a beautiful lo-fi fuzziness sound to it, which could replicate that 1950s song. And the next 7-inch the band released was called Make You Mine, which was released through Group Tighter Records. And the first song on this EP was a cover of the Beach Boy song, In My Room. Best Coast did this song justice. It doesn't sound anything like the original Beach Boy song. It didn't even follow the same chord progression as the original Beach Boy song. They sped the song up a little bit and added the fuzzed out vocals and the fuzzed out guitar. The next song, Over the Ocean, which is one of my favorite songs from their earliest releases with the simple slow drum beat and slow guitar melody in the beginning with simple lyrics about flying over the ocean makes her feel so low and looking out the window and seeing nothing but blue and gray and the way that she sings the end verse with seeing nothing but blue and gray is just beautiful The next song, which is the title track, Make You Mine, and the narrator is singing about a boy and how she wants to make him mine, and she's known him for a very long time, again another slower song. And then the final song, Feeling of Love, obviously again another love song, but the guitar and the drum beat really make this song special, especially the bouquet of flowers as the album cover really screams romance. I honestly love all of the original Best Coast work, and I'm not trying to be biased just because it's lo-fi and I really like lo-fi music, it's just something about original work that artists come out with before they are quote unquote famous is just something special. And what really stood out for Best Coast from any of the other beach surf punk bands that were trying to make it in the industry during that time period was a lot of their songs were romantic but slow. And I feel like back during that time period a lot of those songs that other bands were coming out with were obviously lo-fi fuzz but they were really really fast. And the lyrics are still really comprehensible in all of these songs. And Bethany has an amazing voice. And for the surf punk scene, not a lot of vocalists have that type of voice. A lot of these songs sound like they could be in a 1950s romance movie. Bethany said she was really inspired by 1960s girl groups like the Ronettes, the Shangri-Las, the Angels, the Crystals. First time she heard the Ronettes, she was at her friend's dorm room and her friend had a Best of the Ronettes CD. And once she listened to it, she just fell in love with it. And obviously the Beach Boys were a huge influence on her as well. The most popular 7-inch that the band released was their two singles, When I'm With You and This Is Real, which was recorded at the Black Era Studio in Los Angeles, Hollywood. When I'm With You started out like all the rest of the Best Coast songs, very slow and a lone guitar and vocals in the beginning, with the narrator convincing the listener whenever they're with this person, they have fun. And Bethany's voice kinda sounds sarcastic a little bit, but then it changes pretty fast and the song speeds up, and it's one of the fastest Best Ghost songs we've heard to this point. Bob's solo in the middle of the song really pieces it together, and it was just a well thought out song. Bethany said she just writes how she feels, even if it's simple. Like, when I'm with you, I have fun. Yeah, when I'm with you, I have fun. The world is 
And a lot of people say that When I'm With You sounds like a Beach Boys song, but honestly, it kind of sounds like Dick Dale. And near the end of the song, Beth is wailing she hates sleeping alone, which is very relatable to a lot of 20 year olds. And the next track, This Is Real, didn't get as much attention as it really deserves. It's another great beachy song, and the narrator is talking about fighting with their significant other, but they love each other in the end and they know it's gonna work out, even if their friends don't think so. And by this point, Beth's co got a lot of people's attention. With a handful of songs, Best Coast finally played their first show on June 30th of 2009 at the Echo Curio in Echo Park, California. They originally just played as a two-piece, just Bob and Bethany, and they used their drum track as an MP3 mini disc because Bob didn't trust iPods, but also throughout the original years, they would have a couple random drummers play for them. And supposedly, Bethany stated that her dad even played drums for her once. Also that same year in October, they played their first show with Waves at the Echoplex. They would keep playing shows around the Los Angeles area through the rest of the year. In the beginning of 2010, they released another EP called Something in the Way. The album art also does have another vintage vibe to it. In the top left corner, we have the 1970s hot dog stand. And in the bottom right corner, we have the cookie house. It looks like another 1970s picture. And then on the bottom left, we have someone taking a stroll along the beach. And on the top right, it looks like we have a trainer that could be at SeaWorld. The title track, Something in the Way, could be a reference to the Nirvana song. But unlike Nirvana, this was an upbeat, happier song about a guy. The next song, Wish He Was You, is talking about her being with a guy but wanting it to be another guy. Waking up in someone else's bed at 6 a.m. wishing he was you. A lot of critics like to say all these seven inches sound the same with the blown out amps and the reverbed vocals, but Bethany and Bob stated that this was 2009. The technology back then wasn't the greatest and they were recording these in their bedroom. They weren't going for the lo-fi production, it just kind of happened. Also in that same year in 2010, they released yet another seven inch with two singles, Far Away and Everybody's Gone. These these two singles were some of the cleanest songs that they've recorded. It still does have the lo-fi hint of it. These are very underrated songs. Not a lot of people realize, newer Best Coast fans, but they have a repertoire of songs that they were just never made it to streaming services. So if you're into that early lo-fi sound, I highly suggest checking out this band. And out of all the lo-fi bands, this was some of the cleanest lo-fi work that I think really exists. If you look at bands like Waves and Ty Siegel's early shit, that shit's distorted like a motherfucker. In the early year of 2010, they also went on a small West Coast tour with the band Vivian Girls. And this was their first real tour. They even got to play The Smell, which at the time was a dream come true to them because they cared so much about that venue. Their band would gain more and more popularity as the time went on and it was kind of like a snowball effect, they stated. The band even played Primavera in May of 2010. Also, which helped spike their views, in early summer of 2010, Bethany was featured in a song with Kid Cudi and Rostam Batman Bleach on a song that was called All Summer, which they did for Converse and had an interesting music video, needless to say. And the fans were begging Bethany and Bob to release a full LP. So Bethany and Bob came up with a handful of songs and jumped back in the studio with Louis Pesikoff at Mexican Radio Studios in Echo Park, California. And they recorded the record in about two and a half weeks in January, but they didn't finish mixing it until April. And Bethany said she had no stress with writing these songs. There wasn't a huge amount of pressure since this was their first record and they didn't have an enormous fan base. And later in that year on July 24th, 2010, Best Coast released their debut record called Crazy For You through Mexican Summer Records. And the album art was Divine, done by David Ranger, and included Bethany's soon to be famous cat, Snacks. Bethany adopted Snacks right around the time she started Best Coast. She was looking online for orange tabby cats and shelters, and her mom told her the neighbors down the street have a cat that looks just like that and were trying to give it away because they were going to move. She named him after her favorite cartoon, Garfield. And Garfield liked to eat a lot of lasagna and all kind of snacks. The name fit. 
The album cover just screams summer, with the yellow summery colors all the way to the Southern California coastal map inside the best coast title. And with the Southern California palm trees and the ocean and the sun setting, it's just beautiful. On the album, there's even a song called Summer Mood. The album kicks off with one of their most popular songs, Boyfriend which the drum beat in the beginning, which has an identical intro drum beat to the Bruce Springsteen song, Badlands. And Bethany did state that this song was about her boyfriend, Nathan Williams. And I just wanna make it clear for you on the record, how I said before, everyone thinks all Bethany's songs are about Nathan, but she even stated herself that she's been in multiple relationships and everybody's just known her for being in one relationship. The song Boyfriend was really just a jealousy song about other girls he's with and the other girl is a lot prettier, skinnier, went to college as she dropped out of college. And can we talk about Bethany's vocal range for a minute? I used to know a girl that could sing pretty much anything and I remember her trying to sing this song while I was playing the chords once and she couldn't even hit the notes. This was a really hard song to sing. The next song, which is the album title, Crazy For You. The lyrics are comical in a way, saying, I want to kill you, but I miss you. Honestly, it's just the ups and downs of a relationship being crazy in love with someone. Things that you love and hate about your significant other. With all the ooing and owing near the end of the song, really brings out the 60s surfy Beach Boys vibe that people reminisce about this album. The next song, The End, starts off the song with a lot of ooing and owing, and she's talking about a guy that she really misses, but she's still going on other dates, and how she wants this one particular guy to the end. Forever. One of my favorite songs on the album, Goodbye. I love the intro. Highs are high, my lows are low. Talking about how she's bored without her boyfriend around, missing her mom, even wishing her cat could talk. And the guitar licks in the middle are flawless. Near the middle of the album, we have the song Our Deal, which slows things down a lot and has a similar vibe to the original Best Coast releases. Talks about how this guy takes everything from her and he doesn't tell her his real feelings. It's a very soothing song and one of the slowest on the album. The next song, Braddy B, Braddy Bethany, maybe Braddy Bitch, I don't know. How maybe she's the problem in the relationship. Sorry I lost your favorite t-shirt, I'll buy you a newer one, a better one. And her telling her guy that she's sorry she's a brat and she promises she'll not be a brat anymore. And again, maybe her being an only child, she stated that she was spoiled when she was a kid. The darkest song on the album, Honey was inspired by Joy Division, yet it doesn't sound anything like a Joy Division song. A lot of people say this is cause the guitar melody and whatever pedal Bob used really made this song sound a little bit darker. Next song, Happy, seems like she's trying to convince herself that this guy makes her happy. The whole album honestly sounds lyrically depressing and just a toxic relationship if you really break down some of these songs. And she masks the toxicity, I'm not sure if that's a word, with upbeat sound. If you listen to the whole record, this sounds like a lovely album. Listen to the lyrics and you're like, what? And if you don't listen to the lyrics that much, you might think she's having the time of her life with her boyfriend. And the album ends with each and every day, which she explains she's losing her mind, doing the same thing, and she's bored without her guy. She also proclaims her guy is cheating on her, but says she wished she could go back to 17 and not be so mean to him so he wouldn't cheat on her. Which if that's not fucking toxic, then I don't know what is. Near the middle of the song, she's either talking about herself or talking about her boyfriend saying you will never fall in love. Near the end of the song, the tempo slows down and her vocals are very clear, with the narrator thanking her stars above for sending a man that she really loves. And that was the end of the album. They did later add When I'm With You to be the ending track, which I think that song is perfect to end the album with. And on most of their vinyl releases, When I'm With You was not even on it, but their CD releases, they added bonus track When I'm With You and on all streaming services when I'm with you is on it. And this album is gold with the reverb vocals and the fuzzy guitar, but overall it was a cleaner sound from what they were used to. It was really like their older work, but it got a facelift. 
in a real studio. Yet, Bethany wanted to keep the reverb on her vocals because she said she was a little scared of what her vocals would sound like. How I said before, she was really inspired by the girl bands and the Beach Boys, and this album very much resembles that. Maybe even your grandma might like it. Best Coast's popularity skyrocketed. Everyone was buying crazy for you vinyl, CDs, and shirts. The album was a huge hit. But with as many new fans did come its fair share of haters. With websites like Hipster Runoff calling her music boring, lacking any originality, and how she sings about weed and his boyfriend crazy, talks about her cat too much, using words like lazy, crazy, and baby in every song, calling her a whiny baby spoiled. Bethany even stated when the Beatles wrote their songs about girls, no one called them whiny babies. And Beth is an outspoken feminist and the media even attacked her, saying that her lyrics don't imply this. And uh, let's just look up what feminism means, just, just cause, you know, why, why the fuck not? An advocate for women's rights and the basis of equality of the sexes. Equality. And so what if she writes about guys? Why does that have to do anything with feminism? Who fucking cares? Even to go as low as stating a fourth grader could have come up with those lyrics. Fourth grader could have come up with those lyrics. Read it. And ended the review with mocking the rating that Pitchfork Music gave her album, which was the same score, an 8.4, as her boyfriend Nathan received with his new album. King of the Beach, which was also released in that same month in 2010, and stating that Pitchfork didn't want to cause relationship conflict between them. Dude, shut the fuck up. And Nathan released that album, King of the Beach, which also featured Snacks, and they were even saying that she was trying to replicate that whole Waves album with even putting Snacks on the cover. But Snacks is Bethany's cat if these fucking idiots did their research. And then Bethany would respond to these comments, telling hipster jerkoff, I mean runoff, to eat a dick. Another indie star, I guess you could say star, Marie Stern, Maria Stern, I don't even fucking know who she is, but whatever, took shots at Cosentino, saying she's only famous because of Waves, Nathan's band, her boyfriend, calling her lyrics immature and unacceptable and pathetic. And Nathan, the knight in shining armor, went to Twitter defending his girlfriend, calling Maria Stern an old depressing bitch. And Bethany responded to Maria even saying, there's nothing wrong with writing songs about your cat and boys, and the haters can suck a dick. And it's very unfair to say that she sounds like Waves, is just the girl version of Waves, is trying to be Waves. If you fucking were around in the early 2010s, late 2000s, that surf vibe was fucking big, and everybody and their mother was trying to replicate that sound in the indie scene. And Bethany happened to be one of those girls that wanted to write songs about boys in the beach and sing about her love for California. And for those of you calling her a poser, she is not a poser. She fucking loves California, man. So if anything, Y'all are trying to replicate her. So when I heard this shit about the Maria Stern girl or whatever, talking shit about Bethany, I, I had to look her up on Spotify. 5,005, wait, 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 wait. Hold the phone, hold the phone. That, that doesn't make sense. Oh my God. And hey, I don't know, Maria Stern might have been big back in the 2000s and just fell off <laughs> and Bethany's career just skyrocketed. Hey, maybe it was her fault. She could have wrote a beach album too. Maybe it could have gotten huge too. Nah, I don't know, just a thought. Later that year, Bethany released a diss track to Maria Stern and Hipster Runoff called Eat a Dick, Bitches. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I really wish there was diss tracks in like indie music. Like those type of surf bands, like that would be fucking great. I don't know, what would the lyrics be? Like even you can't even surf, you fucking suck at surfing, you don't even smoke weed. You're not even from California, you're from Portland. <laughs> As a young 23 year old, all this criticism kind of started getting to Bethany's head. She stated that she used to care so much about what people would think about her but sometimes wondered, were they right? Maybe she did suck. 
Maybe her lyrics were trash. Should she stop and just fucking quit? She would always bring herself together. She would go back out there, perform, and record more albums, and is a total fucking badass. And she would do her best to stay away from the critics and what people said about her on the media and the shitty websites. The album would even be on the top 40 on Billboard that year. So you can say, yeah, she had a couple haters, but there was so many people that vibed with this album. In that year, they would go on their first European tour. In that year, they added a more permanent touring drummer to the mix, Ali Kohler, and she used to play in the band Vivian Girls, and that's how they all became friends. And everyone was begging Waves and Best Coast to do a tour together, so they finally did a joint tour in 2011 called Summer Is Forever. And they even promoted this tour by releasing a Christmas song in the end of 2010 called Got Something For You. It was a cute little song that they both sang on, and they would also promote their tour by releasing a split EP called Summer Is Forever, which was released on January 1st of 2011, which featured the Best Coast song, When You Wake Up. Best Coast would also do a live iTunes session with some of their older songs, and they would also release a single called Gone Again. It's funny, Bethany has a lot of songs about someone or her being gone. We have the song So Gone, which was recorded on The Sun Was So High 7-inch, you have the song Everybody's Gone, and you have the new song Gone Again. Also during that year, Bethany became friends with Drew Barrymore. Drew met Bethany after a Best Coast show, and Drew wanted to shoot a concept music video for the song Our Deal. The concept for the music video was a spin on West Side Story, which was a movie about gangs and love. And Miranda Cosgrove was one of the stars in the music video. And the music video was aired on MTV that year. Best Coast would also collaborate with Waves on their EP Life Sucks, which was released in late 2011. The song that Best Coast was featured on was called Nodding Off, and this was a really good song. Going into 2012, Best Coast was invited to cover the Fleetwood Mac Mac song Rihanna for a Fleetwood Mac cover tribute album. Their cover of the song was okay, I don't think they did as well as they could have done. They would also cover the song Storms by Fleetwood Mac, and I think their cover of Storms was amazing, and they really did it justice, and I personally think it sounds better than the original Fleetwood Mac song. Also in January of 2012, they remixed the song Boyfriend with a musician called Lindstorm. It sounds like an electronic pop song. In the spring of 2012, Bethany was invited to design a clothing line for Urban Outfitters, and remember that she went to school for fashion for a minute. Her fashion design was inspired by the 90s, but more specifically the movie Clueless. She said it was really fun focusing on something that wasn't just music. After the non-stop two-year tour, the record label and management from Mexican Summer told them they had to record and release a new record soon. And Bethany and Bob were very surprised about this. They felt like crazy for you had just come out and Bethany stated she hadn't even really written any new songs because she was touring so much and she tried to write songs while on tour but they never really worked out or sounded good she said so Bethany did what she knew best sit on her floor smoke some weed and write songs but now she also had a new roommate who liked to hotbox her entire house Mr. Nathan Williams Best Coast went into the studio with producer John Bryan, who was a huge producer in the industry, and he produced artists like Kanye West and Fiona Apple. Bob has been friends with John Bryan for a very long time, and he knew him way before Best Coast even started. With the unexpected success from their last record, Crazy For You, they were able to have the opportunity to record at Capitol Records Studios in Los Angeles. Bob said while they were recording there, they ran into Paul McCartney. Bethany said that she was very stressed out writing and recording this album, in fear of people not enjoying it. She also stated it was one of her darkest times in life, and she was very depressed. She tried to quit this record numerous times, and she would pull over on the freeway bawling her eyes out. Bob always kept her on track and was kind of like her backbone. She was just feeling so much pressure from the label, from the fans and the critics, and she was abusing substances during this time too, drinking too much, smoking too much weed, even having her fair share amount of cocaine. With one specific night, she did too much coke and she lost her driver's license at a bar. As I was saying, the new record went in a completely different direction. The band was very inspired by 70s rock bands like Fleetwood Mac and the Eagles, and they stated they wanted it to 
sound kind of like crazy for you, but without all the fuzz and reverb. Recorded the record in about three to four weeks. I know a lot of people think this album was rushed, but the only part that was really rushed was the lyrical aspect of it. But in the studio, they had so much time to record. A lot of people think that John Bryan ruined the Best Coast sound, but Bethany and Bob were going exactly for that sound, and he was very supportive of their decisions. But later in the spring, on May 15th of 2012, The Only Place was released through Mexican Summer Records. The album art very much confirms the band's love for California still, the brown bear, which is the California state animal, hugging the outline state of California. And it was a modified version of artwork of sheet music for the California state song, I Love You California, written in 1913. And the album kicks off the title track with The Only Place. And this song is the band's own anthem for California. It was the fastest song on the album, and the drum beat throughout the song kind of has a similarity to a punk song. And in this song, Bethany is very clear how much she loves California. She's saying that we have the sun, we have the babes, we have the waves. Why the hell would you want to live anywhere else? And a lot of people criticize this song for being corny and cheesy and sounding like an intro to some TV show. You know, maybe they're right, but I really love this song. And on Honestly, I felt like it was a great song to kick off the album. The next song, Why I Cry, the song revolves around depression and not caring and really what's the point of going on? And lyrically, Bethany is growing up. She is stating that she now has responsibilities like paying bills and it's really just stressing her out and life is just a never ending hill and she can never catch a break. The next song, Last Year, which I think is a reference to Crazy For You getting so big and them touring like crazy saying that she used to believe in really everlasting love, but she's become very skeptical. And she also touches on her substance abuse, saying she's kicking habits out the front door like her drinking, even though she didn't really get sober until 2017. And she also touches again on spending too much money and soon it's gonna be gone and she needs to write more songs to have a steady income. And near the end of the song, she talks about how time goes by, but just in a depressing manner. The next song, My Life, talks about how she's nervous to go on playing, wanting to go back in time and change all the wrong she's done. And near the last verse of the song, she states, my mom was right, I don't want to die, I want to live my life. The next song, No One Like You, she's talking about a guy, and again, it's a very toxic relationship. She's referencing to do anything, even degrading herself, like sleeping on the floor to fit in to what she thinks her partner wants. Sleeping on the floor is very dramatic, and she stated she's been with a lot of guys, but there's still something special about this one guy and there's no one like him. In the next song, How They Want Me To Be, she talks about money again and how she's making a good amount, but she's very frugal and tries to save most of her money. She doesn't want to act a certain way the media or whoever pictures her to be, and she wants to be herself, but yet still has so much anxiety about what people think about her. The song Better Girl, again, she talks about substance abuse and how she's putting things inside of her that's not good for her. One of the songs on the album, Dream in My Life Away was actually re-recorded and it was originally released through the Make You Mine 7-inch, but it was only available as a digital download and it wasn't on the album. It's actually very cool to see how this song was pieced together in this album. I'm gonna be honest here, I really like the Make You Mine 7-inch version than this version. There's something about the lo-fi quality and the reverb in her vocals that just sound different. And then the next song, Let's Go Home, which is about going on tour, how she's seen all the mountains, all the trees, and everything and being just plain homesick. And then the last song on the album, Up All Night. It was recorded on that split seven inch they did with Jeans Wilder. I think it sounds better on this album than it did on the seven inch. It's very more clear and proper. And I think it was a perfect way to end this album. Released on the deluxe version, which is on all streaming services, there were two extra songs added, Mean Girls and the song Angsty, which that one was also re-released from their first cassette release ever, Where the Boys Are. And overall, the sound quality on this album is very more vocal than it is music based. Bethany said she wanted to show off her voice and tell everyone how good of a singer she is. And it was kind of her own way of flipping off the music critics 
proving to all her haters that she's a serious musician and she has the vocals to back it up. And her lyrics kind of grew up in a sense. They aren't as simple as they were before. But again, she's talking about more serious things like her substance abuse, having to pay bills and save money and spend money. And yes, she does talk about guys on a couple of these songs. She doesn't use the word baby, lazy, and crazy so much. But the lyrics are way more depressing. It's not only about a toxic relationship, it's about her state of life and, and it sometimes sounds like she doesn't even want to be alive. This record had mixed reviews with some people loving it and some people hating it. Mostly the critics were the ones who hated it, but the true fans fell in love with this album. After the release, Best Coast would go on tour. They would kick their drummer Allie out of the band for unknown reasons. Allie was only a touring member and she was never part of the band. But they added Brady Miller to replace her. And they also added Brett Mielke to play bass. They toured all of Europe again and the USA, and they even played a free show at the Santa Monica Pier. Thank you to everyone who came out tonight. Also that summer, Bethany performed with Kendrick Lamar on stage, which was very cool. In early 2013, Bethany did a cover of Roy Orbison's song, Crying, which was released on SoundCloud with Snacks the Cat. They played Billy Joe Armstrong's surprise 40th birthday party the lead singer and guitarist of Green Day, if you didn't know. He was fascinated with the band and thought they were amazing, and he and Green Day would invite them to go on tour with them. When they first went on tour with them, Beth and Bob said it was kind of weird at first. They were playing huge arenas, but they both said it was still very cool to try something new and try and entertain the bigger crowd. Bethany said she was really working on herself through 2013, she was trying her best to slow down with smoking and drinking, trying to keep it to a bare minimum. Their contract was up with Mexican Summer, and they did not want to re-sign with them, and they even fired their manager. And Bethany created her own label called Jewel City. She named after the LA suburb near Glendale, where she grew up. With the band's new claimed freedom, they went in right away to record a new EP with the new producer Wally Gaggle. The EP was recorded at Wax LTDS Studios, and the band wanted to go again in a completely different direction from the last album. They went for more of an alternative rock sound, and they were very inspired by My Bloody Valentine, Maisie Star, and Pasty Klein, and they released their new EP Fade Away on October 22nd of 2013. And the album cover is the view of the city buildings in downtown Los Angeles, with the smoggy fog rolling in. The EP kicks off with the song Lonely Morning, and it sounded amazing. Bob really came back with his guitar on this EP, with a mild distortion to it. She's talking about a guy not calling her, and he's going away and she's referencing that she's in a haze from all the weed she had been smoking and her anxiety with what people will say about her. The next song I want to know is another fast song with Bethany questioning how much her partner really loves her. And then the next song, Who Have I Become? Kind of sounds like an identity crisis to the singer. Not knowing if she loves the or is she just so comfortable with this person? Is it easier just to musk in the relationship? And the guitar riffs in this song really bring it together especially the little solo near the end. The next song, Fear of My Identity, was about how Bethany had an existential crisis after using the sedative Ambien. And then the next song, Fade Away, is the first of the three slower songs we get. Again, she touches on relationship troubles with her partner, she's sick of him, him being mean to her all the time even though she stated she never did anything wrong. And then you get into the next song, Baby I'm Crying, which is my personal favorite song on the EP. It's very drawn back with the acoustic guitar intro, and it's more about her saddening relationship and her trust being unknown. Overall, this EP was some of the deepest lyrics Bethany has written. Okay, yeah, she's talking about guys and relationship troubles again throughout the EP, but lyrically more complex. And this EP was well received with fans and critics, and Bethany knew that she wanted to record a full LP with the same exact sound. After the release of Fade Away, they went on tour again, and they had a release party at Amoeba Records in Los Angeles and San Francisco. 
And this was another highlight moment for Bethany. She stated that her and her friend took the bus back in 2001 for the store's opening day. The following year in 2014, the band would get the opportunity to tour with another huge band, the Pixies. And Bethany also received a huge opportunity to co-sing on a song for Weezer. Rivers Cuomo, the singer of Weezer, tweeted at Bethany stating that he wanted to collab with her, and she was featured on the Weezer song and music video called Go Away. And it was a very interesting music video with Rivers Cuomo trying to win over Bethany. Heading into the summer of 2014, Bethany and Bob would head back to the studio to record their third LP. And just like their last EP, this record was recorded by Wally and it was recorded in the same studio as Fade Away. And Bethany stated this is the most proud record she's ever done. She stated that she had a lot of time to write the songs and it didn't feel rushed at all. And this was the first time a producer really helped orient the songs with the songs going verse chorus verse chorus and even a bridge which she's never really done before the band finished the recording process in the end of August of that year but they still needed time to find a label to put it out on Bethany said that it was really stressful operating her own label she had to plan the tour and do all the marketing for it and it was just a lot easier to go through a label and in early 2015 they signed to their first major label harvest records and finally on May May 1st of 2015, California Nights was released. And this was the first record that featured Beth and Bob on the front cover of the album, with the backdrop being a palm tree in the hills of Los Angeles. And California Nights was a metaphor, how people used to describe California and specifically Los Angeles being a beautiful sunny place, but there's a lot of darkness to it, which not a lot of outsiders see. With all the poverty and crime, Bethany was also referencing California Nights to her insomnia and how she would stay up late at night writing songs and just not being able to sleep. With one of the songs on the album called Sleep Won't Ever Come, and that song was about Bethany staying up for almost two days straight. And the way Bob played the guitar near the end of the song sounded like a clock ticking. The album's sound was very inspired by 90s rock like Oasis and Nirvana but it also has a psychedelic aspect to it as well which could be pinned to Led Zeppelin and even Slow Dive. The intro song, Feeling Okay, which is a fan fan. Bethany is talking about her anxiety and it really sounds like life on antidepressants. And the guitar intro in the beginning has a similar sound to the song called Monsters by Matchbook Romance. And she's stating that she's feeling okay. She's not 100% happy, but she's not 100% sad. Somewhere in the middle. The next song they roll into is called Fine Without You. And it sounds like it's another breakup song about a toxic relationship. And during this time period, Bethany did cut things off with Nathan for a short time. And a lot of these songs are kind of going back to her older ways, talking about boys in a toxic sense. And it was actually interesting because Waves released an album, V, and that whole album was about a toxic relationship. So it's like they're low-key subtweeting about each other. <laughs> the next song, Heaven Sent, which is the fastest song on the album it has a similar sound to the song i'll be there for you by the remembrance and this song is the theme song for the show friends and that's another tv show that bethany really likes the next couple songs in my eyes someone aware when will i change and even jealousy all have the similar idea of talking about more of a toxic relationship and after a couple listens it's just kind of meh but the next song california nights which really brought back the album was the most psychedelic song and the longest song that they've ever done it really brings out the psychedelic dream pop in this album and then the next song fade in fast which has a nice upbeat sound to it again that song is dealing with a toxic relationship and same with the next song running through my head also dealing with a toxic relationship and then they end the album on the song called wasted time and she's just stating she's wasted so much time in this relationship lyrically this album isn't very special 
but musically, it really brings a different aspect to the band, and I just love it. Bob really came through on this album and made it sound the way it sounds. The album was well received and got number 24 on the Billboard that year, which is the highest rating they've ever received from Billboard. In late April of 2015, it also says on Wikipedia that the late 27 inch were outtakes from California Nights, but that's not true at all, and they were specifically recorded for that release. They would tour the rest of 2000. 2015, and in 2016 they would tour with Waves again. FYI, Nathan and Bethany got back together. And their tour was called the Summer Is Forever Tour 2. And both bands released a single together. And Best Coast covered the song Dumb by Nirvana. But the way they recorded it made it sound very lo-fi and distorted, like their older original stuff. In the mid of 2016, Bethany moved houses. She moved from her Eagle Rock house all the way to Burbank. The funniest thing is, she moved into Jane Weedland's old house, and Jane Weedland played in the band The Go-Go's. Just a couple months later, they went on tour with The Go-Go's. As we all know, Bethany was a huge supporter of Bernie Sanders, and she absolutely hated Donald Trump with a passion. As we all know, in the end of 2016, Mr. Trump won the presidential presidential election. And like most liberal Americans, Bethany took this news very, very hard. She was already feeling very depressed and this just made it so much worse. And she would slowly start to get back into drinking and smoking again. And she stated she wasn't even writing anything for a long time. She had major writer's block. She said at one moment she locked herself in her closet and forced herself to write songs. And during that process, she came up with the song Everything Has Changed. She stated the only thing that really changed was she moved houses again, but she was still drinking and smoking, and she was still dating Nathan. In 2017, Bethany took a little bit of a break from constantly touring, she did go on a small tour with the band Paramore for a little bit though. Also in 2017, they would switch touring drummers, and Dylan Wood was the new touring drummer. But a big thing that came in November of 2017 was Bethany decided to finally get sober for good. She stated she had a crazy night partying and woke up hungover the next day, and after that night, she knew she wanted to stop for good. She decided to slowly better herself by cutting off all substances and breaking up with her boyfriend, Nathan, who seemed to be a very toxic person for her. And especially with her being sober and him not being sober, it's very hard to be around someone that isn't sober while you're trying to be sober. It can lead you down old habits. And after they broke up in 2017, they still have not gotten back together and I don't think they ever will get back together. She stated it was always hard dating Nathan. The media focused so much on their relationship and it was so public and so stressful at some points for both of them. And Bethany spent that next year in 2018 really working on herself and trying to come up with more songs even with this writer's block. She started to attend therapy sessions, which really helped her get through some traumatic events in her life. And she started exercising a lot and going on hikes. And also in that year of 2018, Amazon Music asked Best Coast if they would like to record a kids album. They thought it would be a very cool idea to do. They even did a kids song a couple of years ago for PBS, so this wasn't their first rodeo. They named the kids album Best Kids, and though most of the songs were just cover songs, there were a couple originals, a revisited version of the song When I'm With You, but the lyrics were more kid friendly. It definitely was a pop punk kids album though, and I bet some kids are fucking moshing to it for sure. Heading into 2019, in May to be exact, they were invited as the house band on a TV series called What Just Happened with Fred Savage. 2019 was another quiet touring year for the band. They would play a couple shows, but they were really constantly working on their next upcoming LP. The band finally got back in the studio after five years with two new producers, Carlos De La Garza and Justin Madal Johnson. The songwriting process was very different for this album. As I stated before, Bethany had very bad writer's block and Bob really came through with writing some of these songs. He didn't write any of the lyrical content. Bethany did come up with the melodies, 
but Bob came up with the musical portion, and four of the songs on the album were done by Bob. Going into 2020, the album dropped on February 21st of 2020 through Concord Records. The album cover was taken by Bethany in 2017, kinda has a similar vibe to the California Nights background with that Los Angeles Hills. Best Coast took inspiration from the Eagles album, Hotel California, with mimicking almost an identical-like font. This whole record revolved around Bethany's newfound sobriety, ending her relationship with Nathan, and finding new love. Personally, I think this is some of the best work Bethany has put out. The album is mainly alternative rock with a couple dream pop psychedelic songs, but not too many. The first song, Different Light, the guitar riff at the beginning really pulls it together, and it's the first song about sobriety and seeing things differently now because of it. And the drum beat in the song reminds me of the Weezer song, Beverly Hills. Some of the lyrics in the song are just calling out her haters. Stating how people used to call her a lazy, crazy baby, <clears throat> hipster runoff. And she states in the song, maybe I was in on it. With the attitude like all publicity is good publicity. She also talks about again how she used to just drink water and whiskey all the time. And near the end of the song, she talks about how she's healthy now and taking her dog Josie on walks. And then the next song, For the First Time, is about Bethany figuring out who she is for the very first time in about 10 years, because a majority of her time in the band, she has been on substances. And she even takes shots at Nathan Williams. She thought she would die without him, but no offense to him, She's doing great. And then the next song, Graceless Kids, which this is one of the songs that Bob wrote. Bethany is proclaiming that she is the queen of the Graceless Kids. But also in the beginning lyrics, she kind of quotes one of her older songs, How They Want Me To Be. And she's saying, I don't want to be how they want me to be. I know I said that shit years ago. And she's stating that all of her younger fans look up to her and she doesn't really know why, but they do. And she wants to be a good role model, especially the Linda Lindas who are a young band that really look up to her. And then the next song, Wreckage, which is the most pop punk song on the album, just a basic power chord walk down on the guitar. And Bethany is stating she just keeps writing the same songs about toxic guys. She's stating that she's trying so hard to be perfect, but nobody is asking for her to be perfect. The next song, Roller Coaster, which is the most psychedelic song on the album, she starts stating that the only change she sees is that she's not on substances anymore. And she starts talking about how her best friend is getting older, and she could be referencing Bob Bruno or even her cat Snacks, who knows. And she's stating that life has its highs and its lows, like a roller coaster. And the next song, Master of My Own Mind, this song was actually supposed to be on California Nights, but it eventually was taken off and didn't make the cut. It's about pushing through sobriety and staying on track, and also about a toxic relationship. And then the next song, True, which is the slowest song on the album, Bethany is finally singing about true love, not in a toxic way. What? And I know some people have stated this song sounds a little corny, but who fucking cares? This is her first song writing about actual love and not in a bad way, so good for her. But then it jumps into the next song, Seeing Red, about Bethany being mad, toxic relationship, being upset about it, and then the next song, Make It Last, sounds like she's talking about a new relationship, but she very well could be talking about an old relationship. She stated, let's toss out all the bad years behind us. It could be a song about, again, finding a new partner and getting rid of the old partner. <laughs> And then the last song, Used To Be. I felt like this was a straight send off to Nathan Williams. She starts it off by saying, did you forget about me? I'm sure you're trying. You still hit me up for unimportant stuff. I'm a different girl, not who I used to be anymore. But Bethany did state in interviews that she wishes her old partner well, she has no bad blood between him and her, and she just wishes the best for him. And that was the whole album, and I gotta say, this is their best album since Crazy For You. I honestly wasn't a huge fan of California Nights, I didn't like The Only Place, but this fucking album is fucking good. Lyrically, this is their most mature album that they've made. And I would love to see Bethany singing about how happy she is in the next album whenever they come out with it. And again, great work from Mr. Bruno on the guitar as well, bringing the sounds together. So after the release, of course they would go on a huge tour, right? <coughs> Wrong. COVID-19 hit, everything got canceled. They've played, I think they said like maybe five to 10 shows, 
with their last show being on March 11th in Chicago, and then they turned around and went home. So that's a real fucking bummer. You release an album and they expect to tour a fuck ton, but you know. They played the 10 year anniversary for Crazy For You, a live show, and a mini documentary that is nowhere to be found because they deleted it after they view showed it, I guess. I don't know why, but I wish I could have seen it. I missed it. Bethany also started doing a mini podcast, doesn't do it anymore, called Bethline, where it was pretty much an interview and podcast with another celebrity of her caliber. And then she would answer phone calls from fans and answer questions, which that honestly is one of the coolest parts to me. And you know, throughout 2021, they've been kind of quiet as well. They can't really do anything, but they got tour dates coming up in 2022. So jump on the Best Coast website, buy some tickets, go fucking see this band. They kick ass while they perform. You know, Bethany started to wear a bunch of suits and she looks really professional and good. All right, I know I've kept you guys here longer than you probably want to be. All right, let's kick it off with some fun facts, right? In 2020, Best Coast redid their song Boyfriend, a version for the LGBTQ plus community. She used words like, I wish he was my boyfriend, I wish he was my girlfriend, I wish he was my partner. They, them, very fucking cool, good for her, I think it's great. Also in 2020, they released a song on the Scooby-Doo record, I don't even know, a song for Scooby-Doo. It was one of their most popular songs for a minute on Spotify. I don't think it is anymore, but that, that's pretty funny. And they also released a live record, Live at World Cafe. Bethany actually did a song for True Blood with Iggy Pop. She didn't get to meet Iggy Pop, unfortunately, but she did do the song with him. When Bethany was first into smoking pot, she had a marijuana card for a minute. Shout out to Bethany's dad, Ricky Cosentino. He is in a cover band called Woody and the Longboards, which is the Eagles and the Beach Boys. Bethany and Bob are amazing co-workers. They never fight, and the only time they fight is when Bethany was really drunk and she was being loud and Bob was trying to sleep. Obviously, she's not drunk anymore. Mr. Bruno is a huge horror fan, and when he was first into horror, he was only into monster movies, but the first horror movie he saw was The Shining. Miss Cosentino gets really bad social anxiety and gets nervous when fans recognize her in public. She used to smoke weed all the time before going out, but that would just make her anxiety worse. So if you see Miss Cosentino out in public, be nice to her. Sometimes she might not want to take a picture with you, so don't be a fucking asshole. Bethany's original name was gonna be Asia, like the song that Steely Dan wrote. Her parents were into Steely Dan. And she stated, I'm so fucking glad my name's not Asia because my name would be Asia Sharia Cosentino, which is really intense. Bethany is a strong believer in the Me Too movement in the music industry, and she was invited on the Trevor Noah show to talk about it. Bethany's favorite episode from Seinfeld is The Pen. Bob also has his own solo project, and it's more just psychedelic music, but he's been releasing EPs all the way since like 2009 or something in this adorable little bunny costume. So that's fucking cool. So check out some of his work as well. Bob also said he might've been a postman if Best Coast didn't take off. So shout out Mr. Bob, fuck yeah. I work at UPS, yo. I'll fucking hook it up, man. Nah, no, but seriously, UPS is a good job, bro. You get pension, fucking 40 an hour. All right, I'm gonna just dissolve talk. Bethany also has a huge crush on the rapper Drake. Also in 2019, she got the opportunity to perform with the wonderful Lana Del Rey. Bethany is also a huge fan of the Los Angeles Dodgers. In 2020, the band also released two singles from their Thank You 7-inch, which included the song Birthday and Sweetness. I forgot to mention, in 2010, the band also released a single called Sunny Adventure. Alrighty, that sums things up, so let's hit up my my top five favorite songs. Coming in at number five, we have Sun Was High and So Was I off the Sun Was High 7 inch. Coming in at number four, we have Over the Ocean off the Make You Mine 7 inch. And number three, we have Goodbye off of Crazy For You. Coming in at number two, we have California Nights off of California Nights. And my number one favorite song right now by the band has to be Everything Has Changed off of their new album, Always Tomorrow.